The first pitch of game two is next. We turn it over to Bob Costas, Joe Morgan, and Ladies Mr. And Baseball, gentlemen, Bob Euchre, after these messages. And our national anthem. Somebody to hit one over the wall. Well, Cleveland needs to take the same approach tonight that they had in the Baltimore series. And that is be very aggressive, especially on the bases. Here in game three, they won the game because of their aggressiveness. Marquise Grissom scores the winning run on a bot squeeze play. In game one, they had six extra base hits including two home runs, but that might not be enough against Kevin Brown because he has such a good sinking fastball that he normally keeps the ball in the ballpark. A lot of people in the past have questioned Kevin Brown's toughness. They say if you stay close to him, you can beat him. Well, if they watched him perform in game six, they know that all the questions have been answered. He is a tough competitor, and the Cleveland Indians could be in for a long night if he's on. You, what did the Indians in last night? Well, the number one thing was they didn't score enough runs, Bob, and that came from Oral Hershiser mostly. His inability to make a couple of key pitches in key situations. Moise Zalou hit a three-run homer, then Charles Johnson followed with a monster blast. Bonilla followed next with a base hit. That did him in. Chad O.J. is a control pitcher. He's going to have to have it tonight. Pitching hasn't been his problem, though, Bob. It's been the inability of the Indians' offense to provide runs for him. Yeah, in the 19 and a third innings that he's pitched in the postseason, the Indians are yet to score. Let's go down to the field and check in with Jim Gray. Jim, what do you have for us? All right, thank you very much, Bob. Well, it concerns the health of the Marlins. First, Gary Sheffield, who was so very sick last night with that bad stomach virus. He was unable to eat any food or keep any down yesterday. He's feeling much better. I spoke to him at length. He said he's returned all of his strength virtually. He had a very good day, was able to eat all of his food and his fluids. He's keeping it down, and he feels his performance will be much better tonight. The news is not as good for Bobby Bonilla. He has a very bad left hamstring. It has been retaped tonight. He will try and play. He thinks he'll be able to get through the game. It's very much a question mark with the cold weather as they head to Cleveland. Bob? And that weather, as you know, could be very chilly for the middle games, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, if necessary, at Jacobs Field. This is Mike Hargrove's lineup for game two, identical to last night. Roberts got them started, doubled his first two times up. Tony Fernandez the hero of game six with the pennant clinching home run off the Orioles Armando Benitez remains on the bench. Now Kevin Brown and Kevin Brown has a great sinking fastball real heavy ball like a shot put. He uses his change up very sparingly his fastball tails away from the left hander and when he has his good control everything is down below the belt. And let's take a look at the defense behind him. They've only given up one earned run in the postseason. This is a very good defensive ball club. They play very fundamentally sound defense. Nothing spectacular except for Charles Johnson behind the plate. Brown was 16 and 8 for the regular season. O'Neill's in close, and just like last night, flash bulbs popping all around the ballpark. Strike one to Roberts. the switch hitter fouls it off the plate umpire is Dale Ford from the American League Joe West is at first Greg Kosk at second Randy Marsh at third Ed Montague who had the plate last night is in right field tonight and Ken Kaiser on the left field line the 0 2 in game six against Atlanta this is kind of the way Kevin Brown started off. He's thrown a few high, couple of high fastballs here to Bip Roberts. After the third inning in that ball game, he only threw two pitches above the belt the rest of the way. His adrenaline could be flowing here early, and he's throwing the ball a little hard. See, that's another high fastball. That's not where Kevin Brown is most effective. Yeah, he must induce ground balls. If there are not a lot of grass stains on the ball tonight, then he's in trouble. And anyone that tells you that you're not nervous starting your first World Series game, something's wrong with you if you're not. I mean, you're nervous, your adrenaline is flowing. I mean, it's nervous energy. He has a lot of that right.
right now. He's pitching on four days rest, his usual amount of rest. In his two LCS starts, he had six days rest each time. And he strikes Roberts out to begin the game. Allen going away from the fastball that time. That was a nasty slider down low and inside. We've seen it before from Kevin Brown. As Joe said, fastballs upstairs. That's not his style. This is, though, a low inside slider. Bob Pip Roberts cut right through that ball. He was out in front of it, as a matter of fact, and Kevin Brown gets his first strikeout tonight. Now, Vizquel, who has never had much success against Brown, takes a strike. Three for 31 lifetime. Brown, of course, spent a long stretch of his career in the American League. In fact, he was a 21 game winner in 1992 for Texas. This is hit softly over third and foul. This is what Brown has done the last two years with the Marlins. When he won 17 games against 11 losses last year, his earned run average was under two. His run support was the lowest in the league. Otherwise, he would easily have been a 20 game winner. But the combined figures are very impressive the last two seasons. And one and two. Pitched a no hitter this year. Pitched yes, it against the Giants. So he is capable of shutting down an offense when he keeps the ball down. two strikes in the LCS he beat Maddox in game one although he wasn't at his sharpest and then after some early trouble he found a groove and went the distance in the game six clincher to defeat Tom Glavin and the Braves you know the thing that impressed us too Bob about Brown in that game six was his confrontation with Jim Leland about staying in that game full count Normally when Leland or any manager comes to the mound and Joe and I have talked about this if you hear the pitcher tell you what you want to hear I'm right I want to stay in this game let me finish this hitter Brown told him in as many words in the dugout I want to finish this game this gal jolts one to right back goes Sheffield away back and it's off the top of the wall this gal on his way for two and he'll stop there missing a home run by about a foot. Again, the ball is up. That's the only time you're going to see a lot of fly balls off of Brown. He overthrows this fastball, gets it up a little bit. I'm surprised Vizquel didn't get a triple out of this. Let's see. This pitch is up, and he nails it right there. He needs to be down below the belt. This ball is hit hard off the wall, and then watch it bounces away from Sheffield. Again, I'm surprised that he did not get the third base. It gets away from Gary, and by the time he runs it down, just below the yellow line, but Gary has trouble with the carom. And once he plays it, Viscell had to stop at second base. I think Viscell thought he might have hit that ball out, Joe. I think he started Cadillacing a little bit when he got towards second. Definitely should have been a triple. Now the very dangerous Manny Ramirez taking strike one. He walloped a hanging curveball from Levon Hernandez way over the wall and left last night. Bounces one over the mound to his left is Renneria. From behind the bat, he throws him out. With Renteria and Vizquel, you see a contrast of styles. Renteria gets in front of everything, catches it with two hands, and make the, the classic throw for a shortstop. You see Vizquel, Vizquel will pop the ball out of his glove, flip in the air. He is a flashy shortstop. Justice had an RBI single. Off LeVon Hernandez in the first inning last night. Here's the report on him. Uh, he is a pure hitter by that. I mean, he can hit anything in the strike zone, meaning curveballs, change up, fastballs, doesn't matter if they're in the strike zone. The only trouble he has is when he goes out of the strike zone. And if you have to get him out and you have a good enough fastball, you can throw him up and in above the hands, but very small margin of error in there. The scale at third with two down. Ball one to justice last night. Cleveland stranded 12 runners and they were one for 12 with runners in scoring position. This ball is lined to right and they're on the board first. 
Justice comes through in the first inning again. Well, again, that was a pitch upstairs from Kevin Brown. First pitch to Justice that he threw upstairs in this game and watch the results. Here's a line drive in the right center field. This pitch around the inside part, but not far enough inside and not under the hands of Justice. He got on top of it and lines this bullet in the right field. Last night's game against Hernandez, he shot a bullet out to left center his first time up. And tonight, first time up, knocks it around the put. The Indians on top. Matt Williams. And a call strike. game situation each side chooses someone they want to stay away from in you know tough situations Gary Sheffield is a guy that Cleveland Indians do not want to have to pitch to if the game is on the line Dave Justice is the guy that the Marlins does, do not want to pitch to in a similar situation Justice had two hits and an RBI last night they also walked him once RBI single his first time tonight there he goes on the pitch to Williams, challenging Johnson. Never a good idea. That wasn't Johnson's best throw, but it was still good enough. The Indians settle for one. This has a familiar ring to it. The Marlins come up in their half of the first, trailing 1-0 after an RBI from David Justice and their lineup. The home run last night, the three-run shot off Hershiser by Moises Salou, which was the decisive hit in the game, was his first home run of this postseason. And the report on Chad O.J., he's got to stay downstairs, tries to stay outside. He's got a fastball, very good curveball. A couple of years ago, this guy's number one pitch was a changeup, but he has the ability to go inside every once in a while. Adding the curve and the sinker to the pretty good fastball and the out pitch changeup is really what's made him a better than average pitcher. And the defense behind OJ, Grissom and Sutter, four career goal gloves. The guy at the plate, the Marlins center fielder, Devon White, has seven of them, all one in the American League with the Angels and the Blue Jays. OJ's 1 1 pitch. That was a changeup right there, Bob. You know, when you get a scouting report on a guy like OJ who comes to the major league, says he's got a pretty average fastball, nothing really to excite you, but he's got a big league changeup. I mean, it's got to be a big league changeup for a guy like this to make a roster. Call, strike three. Let's go back to the way the top of the first ended with David Justice being thrown out trying to steal by Charles Johnson. Hey, David, you know what? You're on your own. You're all right. Okay. Well, I think this is a good idea to try to test Charles Johnson. Let him know that you're just not going to wait for him all the time, but a nice throw and a nice tag. Renneria stands in and takes a ball. Well, as I recall, you stole twice successfully off Carlton Fisk in 1975 in the World Series, and then two steals against Thurman Munson of the Yankees in 76. So you challenged the best. Well, I think you have to. You can't just say we're not going to run, we're not going to let him shut the running game down. When you have a great pitcher on the mound, the good hitters do not stop hitting. You have to still challenge them and show them that you're not going to be intimidated. And I, so I like the fact that they did run in the first inning. And Renneria whacks one to center field. And it gets by Grissom, but not far enough to allow Renneria to move up beyond first base. Trying to come in to make a shoestring play, Grissom has it skip away from him. Well, once you make your charge and once you commit yourself, you've got to keep coming on. Grissom did that. This ball is hit hard by Renneria. Russell makes up his mind. He's going to try and make a shoestring catch. You can't pull up. You got to come on. And and he, he, he luckily knocked it down. The ball just slid off to the side to hold Renneria to first. But that's the only thing you've got left to do. Hopefully you can short hop it or smother it with your body. And Grissom holds him to a single. 
tough play for an outfield. You got that line drive coming at you, and you make your mind up, you're going to make the charge. You got to go. Now Sheffield in a spot where they can't pitch around it. Taking strike one. He's walked 14 times in this postseason, including twice last night. Nobody wants to challenge him if they can avoid it. Well, what they should try to do is stay down on him, especially with the changeup. A couple of curveballs in the dirt and just see if he will bite. One and one. We'll see how OJ handles relative prosperity. This is the first time the Indians have scored a run in the 20 innings that he's pitched for them in this postseason. back easily despite the fact that they keep pitching Sheffield away Bob look at the outfield alignment for the Indians here Grissom way way into left center field justice about 40 feet off the line and right I should say left and Ramirez way off the line and right field I mean despite the fact they're pitching him away they're still playing as a dead pull hitter Rattaria stole 32 during the regular season Pitch hammered foul. Chad OJ is 26 years old, 6'2, 220, from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, one of the heroes of LSU's 1991 national championship. And as you see, his performance in the postseason belies the 0 2 record. He absorbed both their defeats in their six-game LCS victory against Baltimore. There goes Renteria, and the pitch hits Sheffield, and he is hopping around in pain. It got him on the hand or the wrist. They pick up a base runner, but if this costs Sheffield, and cost Leland his services, it's a Pyrrhic victory if ever there was one. Well, I told you at the at the top of the telecast that OJ will come inside. He's done it a couple of times tonight. This time, coming inside with a fastball. You can see that ball running in on Sheffield, and I think it got him right in the back of the hand. On the back of the hand, and Sheffield is still down and still being attended to. Here it is from the center field shot. Watch this ball run right inside on Sheffield got him right just on the back of the wrist and uh, Sheffield's in, in trouble one more time this ball just kept running in on him running fastball from OJ and Sheffield who's one of those guys that dives in that one nailed him and uh, Sheffield is still down we'll have to wait to see if he can continue I, I say he's going to continue in this game the, 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 the thing you fear there, of course, is those those bones in the back of your wrist, anything smaller, even that large bone back there, Bob, a crack, uh, a break. Uh, you got to say to yourself, thankful that that uh, that O.J. is not a 95 or 98 mile an hour fastball thrower in those kinds of situations. It's nothing new for Sheffield. He was hit by pitches 15 times during the season. So he has come into this World Series in some discomfort. Stomach virus last night that left him feeling queasy and weak. And now he takes one on the hand here in the first. Well, the danger is that it will tighten up as the game progresses. That's what he has to be careful about. Now the PA blares George Thoroughgood's bad to the bone as Bobby Bonilla stands in. Two hits last night. Fouls it back. He began to heat up in game five against the Braves with three hits. It continued in game six as he swung the bat well. And two more hits last night in game one of the World Series. We'll get a report on Sheffield from Jim Gray after this next pitch. Oh and two and here's Jim. All right, Bob. Larry Starr, the trainer for the Marlins, tells us that Gary Sheffield was hit right on the bone of his left wrist. Now, that wrist is already taped up, and it has a sweat band over it, so they feel it'll keep the swelling down already. They're not concerned as to anything being broken, and they're just going to monitor it the next couple of innings. 
step up. With two on and one out, OJ's 0 2 pitch. Renteria, who singled, is at second. Sheffield hit by a pitch at first. The Indians lead 1 0 in the bottom of the first. There go the runners, and Bonilla lifts one into shallow center field. Everybody retreats. Grissom makes the catch. It's interesting. Very few managers like to hit and run with runners at first and second, if that's what it was. It looked like a hit and run. It could have been a straight steal, but Bobby Bonilla gets the fly ball into center field. It's a very dangerous play because if you hit a line driving someone, you're automatically out of the inning. And you already have someone in scoring position, so it's a calculated risk that you take when you hit and run with a Runners at first and second. Now Conine, who didn't start last night, Darren Dalton was at first base, but Conine, Conine came on midway through the game. Lines it to center. This will tie the game. Grissom over to cut it off. Renneria scores. Sheffield stops at second, even at one. That Conan does is he drives in runs. He will be a, he's a good first ball, fastball hitter. This is not a bad pitch. It's out over the plate and down, but he's going that way. He doesn't try to pull the ball. And he drives it in the right center field. Grissom has no chance. Watch this pitch. See how he goes to it with his upper body? That's how you hit a pitch that's away from you. Let's take a look at the tracking of this pitch. This is where it was, right over the outside part of the plate up a little bit and he hit it in the right center field wasn't a bad pitch just good hitting there by Conan computer vision as we've explained supervision rather a computer tracking of the speed and break of the actual pitch so the Marlins quickly get even against Chad OJ and now Moises Alou who had a three run homer off Hirschheiser last night that's with two men on in the first. He hit 292 during the regular year and knocked home 115. And a long drive to left. Back at the track and caught back there by David Justice. Alou thought he had touched one off. They settle for one. The overhead shots tonight are from the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes, based in Pompano Beach, Florida. At the controls, Captain Jim Maloney from Vienna, Virginia. That wouldn't be the old Cincinnati Reds right-hander, would it? If it is, he's gone up in stature, I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, he could throw Ooh, hard, though. That's Jim Maloney. Wow. Wow, well, the fact that Matt Williams is leading off the innings is another reason that you try that steal in the last inning with two outs and two strikes. Had two strikes on Matt Williams, so now he gets a fresh count, and he's one of your power hitters. So you would like for him to start all over. He's had a chance to see four pitches from Brown, so now he should have a better idea of what Brown is throwing. So that stolen base or attempted steal served two purposes. Two and all. John, looking at at Brown in the early going, he doesn't look like he's really got that power fastball now. And and again. They, they play most of these Indians hitters as pull hitters feeling that I mean he's not throwing that well they will pull it. Matt Williams over from San Francisco. And the deal that sent Jeff Kent Jose Vizcaino and Julian Tavares to the Giants. It's a it hard Bonilla goes down to a knee fires across. Conine has the low throw. One out. Now, we've always talked about how difficult it is to be a good hitter. And just three inches makes a lot of difference in the way you hit a baseball. Three inches can make a difference between a home run and a fly out. Let's take a look here. He's looking for a curveball. He's going out to get it. Now freeze it right there. Now see his front shoulder has already started to move out. His front shoulder is gone. 
And that's the reason that he wasn't able to hit the ball out of the ballpark. His shoulder pulled out and he hit it toward the end of the bat and the ball stayed in the ballpark. You see him shake his head right there. He knew. Tommy with a first pitch single. Hoping to break loose in this postseason. He had a home run last night. His first in more than a month and he singles his first time up here. Well Mike Hargrove told us that Jim Tomey was starting to swing the bat a lot better and indicative of the home run last night he had a couple of good rips against Cook in last night's game. Here's that first fastball and a diving try by a runner real but a base hit for Jim Tomey. Down there we the play ball now. Which brings up Sandy Alomar. One for five last night in the series opener. He's had the year of his life though. His 24 season included a 30 game hit streak, a home run in the All Star game in his home park at Jacobs Field, 37 doubles. It was really one of the few seasons of his career where he's been healthy throughout. He's been on the disabled list numerous times, including four knee operations. I talked to him before the game tonight, Bob. He said following the series against Baltimore, he's really beat up though. His hands, he took a couple of foul balls off the hands, the thumb on the catching, on the catching hand. 1 1 pitch from Brown. Bonilla goes to second. Council has it. Pegs to first. Double play. And just like that, the Indians are gone in the second. It's Gary Sheffield on the Marlin bench, flexing that left hand, hit on the back of the hand by a Chad OJ pitch in the first. Charles Johnson. Who had a long home run here last night. Speaking of which, here it is. Immediately following the Alou homer, into the upper deck it went. They estimated it at 438 feet, which seemed conservative. It's a long trip in a cab. OJ's behind him 2 0. Called strike. There's what we talked about earlier with OJ and, and his ability to pitch outside or off the outside corner, and then every once in a while, just, just come in and bust you inside and move you off of there. 2 and 2. OJ was on the disabled list from late June until September 1st with a tender elbow. 8 and 9 for the season. But he's had his moments, as that graphic indicates, and he pitched well in September and has thrown the ball well in the playoffs. Johnson couldn't stop himself on the feeble swing. He becomes the second strikeout victim of the night for Chad OJ. For online coverage of the World Series, log on to MLBWorldSeries.com. Cybercaster Barry Larkin is online right now to answer your questions about the game and the series. Plus, test your batting skills and your baseball vocabulary. All at MLBWorldSeries.com. Well, a new entry for the dictionary. Cybercaster. Craig Council to the plate. Hit 299 for the year and 409 so far in the postseason. Second baseman. There's the hitting chart on Council. As a matter of fact, one of his base hits last night, or the double that he hit last night against Hershiser, he ripped it into the right field corner. Pops this one back of second base, and Bip Roberts wants it. So Brown will bat with two out and nobody on in the second. There are better, better hitting pitchers than Kevin Brown. Of course, he was in the American League for most of his career and never got a chance to swing the bat. Oh, 
throwing to. As he did in the previous couple of games that we watched Brown work, he's up there hacking though. He doesn't he doesn't go up there taking too much. And against a guy like OJ who's pretty much around there. He's had a couple of good cuts. Yeah. Well, that's not fair. <laughs> when a guy's overmatched and then the bottom drops out like that. Third strikeout for OJ. All his pitches were down. Take a look at these all around the belt. And that's why he's giving up the one run. All above the belt, except for the last one. This one's above the belt again. The last pitch to Alomar Jr. is down, and he gets the double play. That's what he wants, is ground balls. So he has to get the ball below the belt in order to be effective. As we go to the third, Marquise Grissom starts it. Brown leaps to grab it and throws him out. And truthfully, in the Atlanta ball game, it was the third inning when he really got his mechanics down and he started keeping the ball down. And from then on, he, he kept the ball down for the remainder of the ball game. So we'll see if that happens today. Chad O.J. walking slowly to the plate and yet acting like he's been there before. <laughs> Grabs a handful of dirt, works it into the bat. <laughs> if you didn't know better, You'd think he does this every day and night, Wait, but look at, look at he asks for time, wants to settle in. Might as well stand in there as long as you possibly can because you're going to be out of there in a hurry <laughs> most of the time. So you got to got to get all the time you can. In interleague play, he had two official at bats without a hit, but he sacrificed successfully twice. Mike Hargrove told us that his pitchers, what with the advent of interleague play have been taking batting practice and especially working on bunting for most of the season. Well the one thing you, when you look at OJ Joe he's choking that bat a couple of inches too. He looks like he's going to go up there and just try to punch one someplace. Well I like that. I think all yeah. pitchers should choke up. Most of those guys go up there right down at the end of the batter with that that knob up in their palm someplace and really taking those big whacks and it doesn't mean a thing. Watch OJ. Get good better bat control when you choke up. Batting gloves will stay new for a couple of years. <laughs> two and two. Hargrove told us that Hershiser, that's no surprise because of his National League experience, and OJ were probably his two best hitting pitchers. Mm -hmm. Hershiser actually was a very good hitting pitcher. Career batting average well over 200 in the National League. Saw so OJ up there around the trademark that time putting plant drop there. I thought if he's going to choke it this much, he's given up. Well, he works the count full. <laughs> Hershiser are getting a kick out of this at bat because OJ is standing in there like he means business. <laughs> and there's nothing more frustrating to know that, than to have that happen to you as a pitcher. And he taps it toward third. Bonilla charges and gets it. And as OJ heads back to the dugout. We head for Keith Oberman. Keith? Bob, that was not accidental. In the previous inning, hitting coach Charlie Manuel of the Indians was conferring with Chad O.J. And we saw the results in style, if not in substance. Well, he looked pretty good in the course of grounding out. That, uh, that talking to a hitting coach doesn't help. My time, boys. I, can, <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> Are you sure that your experience is typical? I may not have been I may not have been talking to the hitting coach. I don't know. I didn't know a lot of guys on the club, you know. <laughs> Maybe it was the hitting coach and not you. Maybe he was the one that wasn't. A couple of times they wanted to send him up there instead of me. That's what really <laughs> bugged me. <laughs> I five there. I for a 5-3 ground out. Sighter said, how do you feel? How do you feel? <laughs> and a strike at the knees to Pip Roberts. Listen to Dave Nelson, who's Mike, the first base right, coach. Best way to make a little contact. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Dave, very okay. little. <laughs> Roberts gives Renteria a tough chance. He throws on the run. Roberts diving into the bag, but he's out. And he looks to his coach, not to the umpire. He says, Dave, did they do me wrong? Dave says, well, maybe not. First of all, you always run through the bag because when you dive, you have to slow down to get there. Now, Bip Roberts is hustling hurry, all hurry, the way. Hurry. And right there, you can't tell when he actually touches the bag. He reaches out with his hand. This is a tough play for Renteria, but he makes the play. And he throws accurately across the diamond. And you can see he is definitely out because he's diving. He's in the air. Now, watch. He's in the air. He has the ball. 
He should have run through the bag, not to the bag. OJ to White. As we move to the bottom of the third, Robert's body was above the bag before the ball got there, but he had made no contact with the bag. You could hear Dave Nelson cheering him on. Hurry, Dave. Hurry, Bip, rather. Hurry, hurry. Tommy will go to the bag himself to retire White. Then, after Roberts popped up, he said, oh, man, I had to be safe. <laughs> and Nelson walked over to him, and we could hear Nelson say, you know what? I can't argue with him. As if to indicate, you know, I think you were out. He said a couple of other things that... That, that we couldn't let you hear. Not Davy Nelson. Not Davy Nelson. Bip Roberts. And it was about style of play and style of calls and style of bat. Renteria singled and scored his first time up. And hits this one over the bag and fair for extra bases down the left field line. On his way for two. Justice has some trouble with it. But not enough to allow Renteria to think about third base. A one-out double. Well, the, the Marlins are actually lucky that the first pitch from Devon White was a bad pitch. Down and out of strike. Now watch this pitch. Almost on the ground, but he finds a hole down the third baseline. And as the ball gets down the corner, watch where the pitch is. Way down below the knees, but he rips it past the bag for extra bases, so he can't argue with that, but they're not swinging at strikes. And Renteria, for the second time in this ball game, gets on base and hopes to score a run. And we'll see how the being hit by the pitch affects Gary Sheffield. First of all, we'll see what his first move is. He dives into the ball, steps straight ahead, or pulls off. Sheffield hit by a pitch his first time up tied at one bottom of the third you know in talking with Sheffield about facing Glavin and a, and a guy like Hershiser, he said I'm looking away constantly and and he should be doing the same thing here tonight with OJ breaking ball for a strike but well, the thing about a hitter who has a quick bat he should always look out over the plate and just react to the ball inside that way you won't pull your shoulders off and you want won't hit the ball at the end of the bat. You'll be right on it. You react to the ball inside. You don't look for the ball inside. Alomar set up outside and they missed the outside corner. You did. Did what? <laughs> no, you no. Look for balls no, inside. no. I looked out yes, over the plate. Did. I tried to react inside. <laughs> you have to keep that front shoulder in <laughs> and react to the ball inside. Just good hitters all the good hitters that's why you can pitch the good hitters inside a lot 2 1 pitch OJ behind Sheffield three balls and a strike and the reason you should look out over the plate is because 90 percent of the pitchers are going to be out over the plate so good hitters look out over the plate like I said and then you react if the ball happens to be on the inside there are those guys Joe I know I sat behind them that look in there every once in a while and I mean if you come in there they open up so quick on you and, and really try to go deep. Dangerous pitch for OJ. And he walks Sheffield. The 15th time Sheffield has been walked in this postseason. Well let's take a look at these pitches down. That was a strike on the outside corner. Just off the outside corner. There's a change up. And a fastball just off the corner. And Sheffield is on first base, but they're not going to give him much to hit. Right. Well, Mike Hargrove said that. He told us that yesterday. He said it again tonight. He said, we're not going to let Sheffield beat us. I mean, it's going to be a real bad mistake before that guy gets anything to hit in a tough situation. Bonilla flied to center his first time. Taking strike one. The scouting report on Bobby Bow. Well, he likes the ball out over the plate. Are they staying in tight with him as they did on the last pitch? He will chase changeups down and away from him. And that's what they'll do if they get ahead in the count. Man, he made a mistake there. 
But he got away with it. He got away with it. And they are ahead of the count, 0 and 2. And you can see the facial expression of Benia. He knows that he had a pitch to hit and did not hit it. This is a fastball that's supposed to be in. It's not in. It works its way back out over the plate, and you see exactly where Bonilla's swing was. It was there. Look at that pitch. Right there, middle of the plate almost, and it was supposed to be a fastball in. Down and in, one and two. Chad OJ in September had three starts, during which his earned run average was 0.50. Then in the postseason, despite his 0-2 record, his ERA is under three. So he's been throwing the ball well now for six, seven weeks. Here's his 1-2 pitch. In the air to left. Just has started back. Now comes in and toward the line to take it. And again, Bobby Bonilla had a good pitch to hit. That pitch out over the plate, off speed from OJ. And Bonilla hit that little fly ball to shallow left. He knows he had a good pitch to hit. Let's take a look at the pitch before he hits this fly ball left. A fastball inside. Right there, you see him stretch his legs out, and he grabs his left hamstring right there, like maybe he strained it a little bit, trying to get out of the way of that fastball. Well, it's tender to begin with. Strained in game six last Tuesday night in Atlanta. Conan, an RBI hit his first time. Conan has had two big base hits in the postseason, one against Maddox that won the ball game, and here tonight against OJ. Both of them first pitch fastballs, and he jumped right on them. So they start him off with a breaking ball, this time with the runner in scoring position. Next one to the original Marlin is in there. There you see Conine's hitting chart, basically a pull hitter, but when he gets two strikes, as we noticed last night, he shortens his swing and tries to hit the ball back through the middle, and that's the proper approach with two strikes. And his big hits in this postseason have been back up the middle. That's why OJ got away with that last breaking ball. That was a hanging breaking ball, and I think Conine looking that way, trying to go the other way, looking for something away. Right field. Coming in is Ramirez. The Marlins strand two in the third, and it remains a 1 1 game. Ah, Mr. Baseball's fans are <laughs> legion, and they are to be found in their usual location here at Pro Player Stadium. I'll tell you, when they opened up the upper deck and utilized the football seats for the World Series, some of these people were placed in spots where the game is but a faint rumor. Yeah, you better have a radio or a portable TV. Piskel takes a breaking ball low from Kevin Brown. Prior to his first at bat against him tonight, he was three for 31 lifetime against Brown, but rifled a double off the wall that barely missed going out for a homer. Two and up. Every once in a while, Bob, and, and having watched Miskell throughout his career, every once in a while, he'll go up there and look for something inside, despite the fact that he's an opposite field hitter. He'll look for something inside and try to pull you. And he hits a home run every once in a while. Brown falls behind him 3 and 0. Last night's crowd of 67,245 was the largest for a World Series game since the Yankees and Dodgers at Yankee Stadium in 1963. That's strike one. And it was more than 20,000 above the normal baseball capacity here, which is in the vicinity of 44, 45,000. Full count. That's a beautiful sight. It really is coming in here last night and watching this place fill up in difference to what we had for the championship series. It was, uh, it was big time. The parking lots yesterday jammed up. Fouls it off his foot or ankle. And decides, well, I'll, I'll just lie right here for a little bit. I tell you, people don't know how hard that is. And, and I mean, when you hit a ball that hard off your instep or off your shin or your ankle, I mean, folks, it hurts. It really hurts. And he hit that one right off his ankle, off the inside part, on his right leg, and down he goes. And it takes a while to walk it off. I know Joe's had it happen, too. We've all had it happen, those of us who... Uh, have been unfortunate enough to do it. 
I mean, sometimes it, it, it tears the skin. The ball, the spin of the ball actually tears the skin on your shin, on, on your ankle. You drive a ball off your toes. They hurt. But it's not nearly as frightening as this. Well, we have the opportunity. NBC, Halloween Sunday. Make sure the doors are triple lock and the windows are nailed shut. Hold my hand. Well, let's not go that far. <laughs> the scale is smarting a bit, but he's back in. And the 3-2 pitch. Line through the middle for a base hit. Well, throw that back out the window. Three for 31 lifetime against Brown. And he smacked the ball twice against him tonight. That'll make you feel a little bit better because you've come up with a base hit. But it, it's still stinging a lot. Another one of those guys too, Bob, when you and and, and Vizquel's, he's a gamer. He, he's really a player. You get him in this situation where he's knocked one off his leg now singles to center. Don't be surprised to see him run too. Except he'd be doing it against Charles Johnson. He did steal 43 during the year. He can run well. Mike Hargrove told us despite the fact that it's Johnson. Once in a while, they're going to have to do it. And this is one of his primary people. A 1-1 game in the fourth. Double play ball. Council to Renneria. And on to Conine. Well, this is a perfectly executed 4-6-3 to six to three double play. But let's watch where the scale slides. Because technically, he should have been called out anyway if it was not a double play. You have to be able to touch the bag in your slide. Watch where he goes. He goes way out there after Renteria, and there's no way he could touch the bag. So if, if this double play would have been missed, I guarantee you they would have called him out. Look at that. See, he's going way out after this shortstop. You have to be able to touch the base someplace in your slide, and there's no way he could have reached it on that particular slide. Now go over and get a little ice on his ankle. There you see they're gonna maybe even tape it a little bit, try to keep the swelling down. He's gonna take his shoe off now while he can still get the laces without cutting the laces. Now good news for the Marlins is Justice Bats with nobody on. He singled home a run in the first. Brown's 0-1 pitch. This is the base hit that David Justice got. Well, the fastball up. You have to keep the ball down if you're Kevin Brown and pitching to David Justice. A ball and two strikes. Taking care of Vizquel and doing it quickly. As he's an out away from returning to the field. Shows you how the game has changed you. Yep. Ethel chlorine, they used to put that on our. Spray it on. Ethyl chloride just so you could give you a little slight chill on your. You know, that, that stuff, that stuff sometimes, Joe, felt worse than the actual <laughs> ball hitting you. Ethyl chloride, unbelievably cold. Cold strike three. Just the second strikeout for Brown. To the bottom of the fourth, tied at one. On to the bottom of the fourth. Moises Alou, Charles Johnson, and Craig Council are due. Alou just missed hitting one out. His first trip to the plate. Fly to Justice on the warning track and left. Another view from the Goodyear Blimps Stars and Stripes. It was 1960 when the Goodyear Blimps first began live sports coverage. That was at the Orange Bowl in Miami. So they're flying over familiar territory. Alou with a drive to the gap in left center field. Grissom going back. And this ball's off the wall. Alou speeding towards second. And in there with a leadoff double. That shows you the difference in which a guy that keeps his front shoulder in. And a guy that pulls off, he hit a breaking ball the first time, so they try to throw him a fastball here. And watch where his front shoulder goes, and everything stays right there, and he uses his hands 
to drive this ball up the gap in left center field. And he hustles in with a leadoff double. Another bad pitch, though, by O.J. That was a high fastball. He got away with the curveball, as you said, Joe, on a Lewis first time up. This was a high fastball, about letter high, and he hit it for a double. Each team now has four hits. Johnson struck out his first time up. Breaking ball in the dirt. Let's take a look at the pitch that he that low hits off of OJ. That's a high slider or a low cut fastball. He drills in left center field. Well, let's see if Charles Johnson here. With the runner at second and nobody out, tries to hit one to the right side to move him. 1 0 pitch is tapped out in front of the plate. Alomar takes the third. They got him. Was it a good play by Alou to try to advance? Well, you, two things. You do not make the first out or the last out of an inning at third base. Let's take a look here. Johnson definitely not trying to go the other way. Good job by Sandy Alomar Jr. He jumps out, pounces on it, fires to Matt Williams. Matt Williams makes the tag. Very close play at third base. And watch this. Sandy throws it. Alou goes to the outside. And right on top of the play and calling him out. Let's take one more look. I'm not so sure he's out there. I mean, it's a very close play, but, you know, Randy Marsh right on top of the play calls him out. Alou did not argue. Again, Charles Johnson, Joe, with a chance to, to, to advance a guy with the ball to the right side, didn't do it. He got out in front of that little breaking ball, hit that little roller. Well, he never tried to go the other way. His approach to hitting in that at bat was to drive him in, not to go the other way. And I'm sure that came from the bench. So Alou is cut down at third. Johnson becomes the runner at first with one out. And a strike to counsel. The disabled Alex Fernandez out for the postseason and at least half of next year with a rotator cuff tear talking it over with Alou. It was interesting Devon White just said to him safe. But he's not out there anymore. No. <laughs> Randy Marsh right on top of the play with right. the correct call. The 1-1 one -one pitch is a pitch out and there's nothing on. Good call by Alomar though. With Johnson the runner at first and Jim Leland told us he said hey anytime any place we're going to try anything. That time Alomar thinking they might be moving the runner. Put on the pitch out Jim Leland. And Johnson is chased back last night's game was actually three games in one. Little ball at the beginning, infield in, sacrifice attempts, hit and run, a 1 1 game. Then in the middle innings, each team connected for two home runs. And then in the late innings, it was all about the Marlin bullpen, which was again very effective and held the lead for LeVon Hernandez. That's why it was a much better game than it appeared. People that saw the game in that same perspective really got a kick out of the way the game was played because it was. A completely different game in the middle and the ending innings. The first three were different than the middle and the last. OJ has fallen behind Council three and one. Peering in at Alomar as if to say, "You're not asking me to throw that, are you?" I tell you what, Sandy Alomar, when he puts down signs, he makes sure the pitcher can see him. Rocked foul by Council. I don't know if I've ever seen a catcher put the signs down as low as Sandy Alomar does and you might be saying to yourself well can you see him from either side from either dugout and you can't because Alomar when he gets down watch the way he gets down and then when he his legs and that little pad that he wears behind his leg or on the back of his shin or the uh, the, the Achilles area you can't see it you can't see from the dugout either dugout runner goes on the three two pitch and Council pops it into shallow right. Johnson retreating to first. Bip Roberts for the catch near the line. 
So that's the second out. Let's look ahead to a week from today. An NFL doubleheader. It begins at noon Eastern with the NFL on NBC. In game one, most of the country will see John Elway and the Broncos taking on the Buffalo Bills. And then in game two, Mark Grinnell and the Jaguars against Cordell Stewart and the Steelers, or perhaps regional action. There's the list. The NFL Allie. on NBC begins next Sunday at noon Eastern. Well, the Oakland Raiders gave the Broncos all they could handle today. They whipped them. How about the Raiders? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Elway and Denver finally went down for the first time this year. Kevin Brown went down on strikes his first time up. One and one to him here. He's been on a couple of OJ fastballs, but when you throw him that that nasty breaking ball this first time up, it was see you later. Panthers hockey team made it to the Stanley Cup Finals in just their third year. Here are the Marlins in the World Series in their fifth year. Pat Riley has made the Miami Heat into a contender. Two one pitch coming to Brown. Swings and misses two and two. But the last South Florida pro sports team to win a title was Don Shula's Dolphins of 1973. Their second consecutive Super Bowl championship in that instance. Little tapper. OJ pegs it to Tommy to take care of Brown. So Alou opens the inning with a double, but nothing comes of it. And it's still tied at one. Can't get any more even than that through four. Now Kevin Brown back to work. Matt Williams, Jim Tomey, and Sandy Alomar will face him in the Cleveland fifth. As Joe Morgan mentioned earlier, Kevin Brown is capable of being not just good, but overpowering. This year, he pitched a no-hitter against the Giants that was very nearly a perfect game. He hit Marvin Bernard of the Giants with a pitch in the eighth inning. That was the only base runner. He also threw a one-hitter against the Dodgers with only a Raul Mondesi single spoiling that. Well, you know, he hasn't... Uh... He hasn't uh, shown the power that we've seen from Brown in postseason yet. In those couple of games against Atlanta, I mean, he was he was really throwing hard. Indicative of only two strikeouts here tonight. But he's making the pitches. Sinker ball working well. Breaking ball down and away from the right-handed batters. He jammed Williams his first time up and got a little 5-3 ground ball. Ball one to Williams leading off here in the fifth. The Indians are tied in this game 1-1, and that's how they want to leave South Florida to head home. Tied 1-1 in the series. A pop into shallow right. Coming on is Sheffield, but he can't get there. A bloop single to lead off the fifth. That's why it's so difficult to pitch a no-hitter, because he made a perfect pitch on Matt Williams. He hits it off the end of the bat, and he bloops it in the shallow right field. And there's Jim Tommy hit a home run in last night's ball game. And he hit it to the opposite field, which is something he does frequently when he's in a groove. During the season, he had 40. But as we've emphasized, he hadn't hit one for more than a month and had been frequently benched against left-handed pitching in this postseason despite those 40 home runs and the 100-plus RBIs. Singled his first time. Also the other way. Kelly hit a bullet against Kevin Brown back in the second inning. Line drive past the diving Renneria. Checks a swing, 2-0. Oh. This is the hitting chart on Jim Tomey. He's more of a pull hitter, but as Bob said and we talked about during the game last night, He's got excellent power to all fields and will go the other way. He'll he'll take the outside pitches and go to left field. Foul tips that one. Tommy has that distinctive style as he awaits the pitch, where he holds the bat out at an angle for a few seconds and almost seems to be motionless. Two 
two. Last foul ball rattled CJ a little bit. Here's again a high fastball that Tommy has a good rip at it. And right off the mask of Charles Johnson. Dale Ford said, better you than me. <laughs> Williams, who singled open the inning, is at first with nobody out. Brown's 2-2 pitch to Tommy. Full count. Ooh. That looks like more of a cut fastball than a slider because it had a lot of late movement on it. it looked like he just cut the ball trying to get it in on the fist of Tommy. Tommy wouldn't bite. Struck him out. That final pitch is a Kevin Brown that they know and love. But one thing about all these pitches, except for the foul ball, all of them are down. See, everything is down. That's the way Kevin Brown wants to pitch. And the final one down and away, and that had great movement on it. So now Sandy Alomar, the pitch out. But Williams wasn't going anywhere. He's a sneaky base stealer. He swiped a dozen this year, which might surprise you. Dave Nelson is coach behind him. Jeff Newman is the Indian coach at third. A lot of times, teams do not like to pitch out on the first pitch because if you pitch out and you miss as they did now, it means if you want to put a play on, you can because 99% of the time they're not going to pitch out two pitches in a row. Alomar hitting only 204 in the postseason, but he's had a lot of big hits, three of them for the distance. And the game winning hit in game four against Baltimore in the LCS in the ninth inning. This ball hit toward the hole. Even Renneria can't get it. Two singles here in the fifth, first and second with one out. And that wasn't a bad pitch by Brown. That ball was inside. Alomar really turned on it very quickly. And the pitch before he came up with the base hit, he looked like he may have jammed his elbow a little bit. There's that fastball inside. You could see Sandy pull his hands in toward his body a little bit as he ripped that one past Renneria. But the pitch before, Joe, when he swung and missed, and you, you've seen it happen, you've had it happen, where, where you swing and miss at a ball, and you either pop your wrist or you pop the elbow, and you see Alomar going all the way around, and he did have some discomfort in his left elbow. Grissom with a chance to snap the tie. Bob, that's how, how David Justice injured his elbow a couple of years ago with his follow through. Six hits now for the Indians off Brown. And maybe more. Renneria can't get this one. Williams is being waved home by Newman. Here's the throw from the load. Not in time. Three singles produce a run in the fifth, and Cleveland is back in front. The more I watch Marquise Grissom, the more I realize he is a very good low ball hitter, much better than a high ball hitter. This pitch is down. Look at that. And he goes and gets it and pulls it in the hole. Just bounces over the glove of Renteria. Low fastball in the hole. Now watch Renteria. He gets there, but the ball bounces over his glove. He would have been able to make a play if it would not have bounced it over his glove. Williams gets a good jump, and he's coming home. Alou had a shot at him, comes up and fires, but just a little late, and the Indians have the lead. But that ball would have been caught by Renteria if it would not have taken the bad hop over his glove. He may have not had a play on anybody, Joe, but he certainly would have stopped a run from scoring. Marquise Grissom, the MVP of the American League Championship Series, with a big hit here. O.J. looking to sacrifice, gets the bunt down, and it works. Good job by O.J. Now they have a chance of really having a big inning with a base hit here from Bip Roberts. Let's go back and listen to what Dave Nelson, the first base coach, had to say to Sandy Alomar once he reached first base after his single. What happened? 
Oh, who's there? Extended your elbow. Ouch. <laughs> well, an excellent diagnosis on the part of Dave Nelson. Ouch. Bip Roberts, 0 for 2. A 3 2 hitter for the regular season. Even though Vizquel has two base hits in this ballgame, I would definitely think about trying to get Bip Roberts to chase something out of the strike zone rather than going right after him. He's a much better hitter than Vizquel is. And there's some proof. Renneria can't get to it. One run home. Here comes the second. And it's four to one Cleveland. Bip Roberts is a 300 hitter. And Vizquel has not had a lot of success over his career against Brown. He's had a couple of hits today, but I still would rather face Vizquel with a runner on base than Bip Roberts. Kevin Brown goes right after him. This is a sinker or the middle of the plate, and he hits it right back through the middle. Brown almost barehanded it, but he decided not to, which was wise. And two run score. Not all that bad of a pitch either, Joe. Downstairs, but Roberts, as you said, went down and got it. Here's the reaction of the Cleveland bench. There's OJ at the end. He's more restrained, but the others are whooping it up. The 1 0 pitch to the scale is ball two. Now, how important in the mix of all this is the sacrifice bunt by OJ? You think about these American League pitchers so unaccustomed to hitting, but OJ able to get the bunt down in a crucial situation. And that adds at least one run off that play and who knows how much different the pitching pattern might have been or what might have gone differently had OJ not bunted successfully. And I think it was a very smart move by Mike Hargrove. Try to put that extra run over in the scoring position. I know it's why I know it's better than letting them up there and hit. I know that. <laughs> Since the DH became a rule in 1973 in the American League American League pitchers have hit only 078 in the World Series. As you might expect because they never bat except in these World Series situations. But here OJ was able to help himself and in a big way. Back. The only difference now Bob since interleague play came into being is the fact that this year, yeah. American League pitchers do get a chance to hit all season long. I mean it's a it's a big thrill for them. It's a big time. They play their little game before the regular game gets underway. Two and two to the scale. So just this year yeah, the advent absolutely. of interleague play and just a handful of games mm -hmm. truth be told. But it's still despite the fact that it's only a handful. I mean they've got to hit and they've got to get up there and bunt. And the batting practice comes in handy once you get to the World Series. The BP you've taken all year long. Roberts diving back. He stole 18 on 21 attempts for the year. Full count. And now, of course, he will be running. Jim Leland getting a little concerned here with Kevin Brown. Again, he doesn't have the velocity. The bullpen is busy for the Marlins. He doesn't have the velocity he did in the series against Atlanta. Ball four. So the Marlins take a one nothing lead in the series as their rookie Levon Hernandez beats Oral Hershiser one of the great postseason pitchers ever in the opener. But now with their ace they're trailing four to one and the bullpen gets going. Heredia the left hander Alfonseca the right hander Alfonseca was added to the roster for the World Series to replace the injured Alex Fernandez. He had not been on the postseason roster in the first two playoff rounds. If you're Larry Rothschild I think you have to question that last pitch. It was a 3 2 breaking ball to Vizquel. Vizquel is not a power hitter. And your best pitch is a sinker. Here's what Manny Ramirez has done so far in two at bats tonight. 
Edgar Renteria threw him out from behind second base. And his second time up, a 4 6 3 double play. Last night he had a home run. And he hit 26 of them during the season. There's there's the Kevin Brown that that they want to see. That's an inside sinker and off the plate against Ramirez here. But for the most part, they've been they've been from the middle in, middle out, and hittable. Inside with that one, one and one. The Indians with great speed on the bases. Roberts at second. This Cal at first. Three runs home in the fifth, and they lead it four to one. Two and one. one into center field but Devon White is there that closes it out but not before three Indians cross the plate in the fifth Keith Alderman back at game two of the World Series and the official diagnosis on Sandy Alomar is as you heard Dave Nelson say before an ouch no treatment required he's okay Bob all right Keith and Devon White starts it in the bottom of the fifth finally the Indians Give Chad OJ some runs to work with. He's up four to one. Two and all the count. We've been joined in the booth by as special a guest as you can get in a baseball setting. And after this first batter, we'll talk with him. Two balls and a strike to the Marlin center fielder. That's the first good pitch that Devon White has waited for in this entire ball game. He's been swinging a lot of sinkers low and in the dirt, but he finally waited and got a good pitch. He just didn't hit it. Threw him the change, two and two. Well, OJ struck him out on a changeup back in the opening inning, and then, as Joe said, back in the third, a little weak ground ball to Jim Tomey at first. Lines it into center. It's a leadoff hit. keep you in suspense any longer an inning ago we turned around and we were both surprised and pleased to see Joe DiMaggio walk into our booth unannounced it's great to see you Joe nice to see all three of you <laughs> nice to see you Robert Hall of Famer <laughs> future Hall of Famer. What are we going to call you? you? <laughs> Just glad you're here, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be here with all three of you, believe me. It's our pleasure. Rateria stands in. He led the majors with 19 sacrifices. They trail here by three. And he takes a strike. Joe Rea tried to call time there, Bob. Just excuse me a second. He tried to call time and the pitch was delivered anyway. Called a strike by Dale Ford. Yeah, he was trying to stop the action, but Dale Ford wouldn't go for it. A little too late. Strike one. And we'll talk with Joe DiMaggio as the inning proceeds. Wide at first with nobody out. Bluffs the go, and Renteria takes a ball. You played in 10 World Series, Joe, and there's nothing like it for a ball player. Well, I think there have been a couple of other players with the Yankees that had 10. Maybe one, one more like Yogi Bears mm -hmm. means in that many, I'm sure. And so has Mickey Mantle. But they tell you they'll spawn all the way through the line. But and I meant know, the we thrill. We had a reason. We had a reason to be uh, at that time. When the first four years of uh, the years that I was with the Yankees, I hate to take it on. I know you got these pitches to call and so wow. forth. And, and there's a call strike one and two. Go ahead, Joe. No, because we had a club just loaded with potential Hall of Famers, meaning Gary, Dickey, Ruffer, Gomez, two pitchers, and Lazari was already with the club, and eventually we all got, plus me, <laughs> we all got into the Hall of Fame. 
So that's why we had the dynasty at that time. Two balls and two strikes. Do you ever think your 56 game hitting streak will be broken? No I've one been, really has approached it. I've been saying that for 50 years that it would. <laughs> so someday one I might be right. <laughs> no I don't think you're going to be right. <laughs> Renneria cuts and misses and he's down on strikes. Well if my math is correct a 56 game hitting streak and the record has now stood for 56 years. That was 1941. That's right. Now let me say this to you, Joe, while you're here. When I got close, I said, no way, I'm backing <laughs> off. I, I, I really did. And respect you, and I'm saying it to you tonight because you're here just to get it off my chest. <laughs> What's as close as you got, you, your longest hitting streak? Uh, maybe six, seven. <laughs> But well, I played with Pete Rose when he had the 44 yeah. game hitting streak yep. and he was probably the closest in recent history and I mean it was tough every night so I I just don't think anyone will ever be able to do it. He was a switch hitter yes, so he, he had was. all the advantages you can get and it's just so difficult in this day and age because one of the reasons because of the, the specialization of the you know the relief pitchers and the middle relievers and so forth and so on. And so I just don't think anyone will be able to hit 56 games in a row. Sheffield pops one foul. And it'll make the seats. Obviously, there have been many great ball players through the years, Joe, but only a tiny handful still capture the public imagination. You last played in the big leagues in 1951, and yet even youngsters who never saw you play have a mental image of you. That must make you feel good. It does. It really does. Even those five, six year olds. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go do a little cameo for uh, Julie Harris. She's going to appear in it. And we're all talking about these young children. <laughs> but I can't give you any more information now while this big game is going on. <laughs> I had a conversation with Ted Williams once. Yes. And, he, and, you know, we all knew you were just a great player, but he said that you were the best hitter. He was talking about hitting. I mean, you know, most people think of Jody Maggio, you think of him, you know, gliding around center field and all the great things you did, but not so much as just, you know, a hitter like Ted Williams hit 400. But he said you were a great, great hitter. Well, I tell you the best I'd ever seen through my eyes has been him and I saw Garrett and people like that hit. But I won't tell you. He was a mob. <laughs> he was a magician, believe me. One of modern baseball's most dangerous hitters, Sheffield awaits this pitch. Oh. Bounces it to third. Williams to second for one. Can they turn it? Yes, they can. And that rather abruptly. Ends our visit with Joe DiMaggio, but what a pleasure! Thanks hey, very good much. Good to be with all three of you. Thank you. Thank You'll, you. We'll find a spot for you. <laughs> <laughs> Leading four to one, the Indians send David Justice to the plate, followed by Williams and Tommy in the sixth, and Kevin Brown starts him with a strike. It's it the opposite way and deep and into the seats foul. That was interesting, you know, Joe DiMaggio came in, he said, Joe Morgan, Hall of Famer, Bob Costas, <laughs> future Hall of Famer. And as he walked out, he said, you will find a place for you. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> I should have left with him. <laughs> I said, I'll find a place for you. <laughs> I wouldn't mind tagging along with him wherever he goes. Rounds 0-2 pitches high. Well, your career total of 14 home runs was a good month for the Yankee Clipper. Oh, yeah, I know. Well, I did mine during the offseason. That's when they really counted. He's a great guy. I love being around that guy. I really do. Two and two to Justice, starting it off in the sixth. Was amazing. He just walked in unannounced, Joe DiMaggio. Turned around and all of a sudden there he was. Well, I was actually back there when he walked in. And uh, he said, I stopped by to see you, Bob. And I said, well, why don't you say hello to Casas and Joe, too? <laughs> and he said, okay. Justice walks to start the sixth. You know, Bip Roberts has not played much second base, but watch this great turn because Devon White comes in awfully hard. And watch this turn. He gets rid of it, and he's in the air at the same time, avoids the sliding 
Devon White and turns the double play right there. And the first thing you have to do as a second baseman, you have to think of making a double play first and then protect yourself second. And that's what he does right there. I mean, that is a beautiful executed double play there by Bip Roberts at second base. You can't do it any better than that. A strike to Matt Williams, whose single started the three run Cleveland fifth. The one thing, thing that told me last inning that he doesn't have a lot of confidence in his fastball today was the pitch to this scale. This is out of play and you can see him going to more and more breaking balls with justice in this inning and also to Matt Williams because if he had his confidence in his fastball a three and two pitch to Omar Vizquel would have been a fastball would have been a sinker because you do not want to get deep in this lineup you know have to face Ramirez or Justice but he does not have as much confidence in his sinker as he normally has because there's no way he would have walked Vizquel with a breaking ball. You see he is throwing more breaking balls this inning than he had in the entire ball game like we saw him pitch in Atlanta. And to take it one step further, Joe and Williams last at bat back in the fifth inning, he threw him a sinker low and outside. He went down and got it and hit it to right field. Round through 140 pitches in going the distance in game six against Atlanta. That was his 84th and we're here in the sixth. But the big difference is he's trailing four to one and he hasn't had anything close to his usual mastery. Well, that time you could see on that last high fastball to Williams, he really dropped down that time. I mean, the ball just sailed out from under him, didn't really get on top of the delivery, and, and that high fastball off the outside corner. Brown, to be effective, really has to get on top to make the sinker dive down and in. Watch this. He gets underneath that ball. Look at it right up in the air, pulled down by Charles Johnson. And the 2-2 pitch bounced to Bonilla. There's one. Council trying to turn it. Safe at first. And Bonilla, because I think his hamstring is bothering a little bit, he took a little extra time to make sure he made an accurate throw, which is the right way to do it. You have to make sure the first one before you get a double play. Now watch him. He'll get the ball, but watch he hesitates a little bit, like getting himself together instead of whipping it over there quickly. Council did not come across the bag as we saw Bip Roberts do. This is more an off balance throw than we saw from Roberts. If you come across the bag, you can get your balance and make a better throw. But you see Matt Williams beats the throw back to first base. Council could not get much on his throw. I think Justice was really on Council too, Joe. He got down there in a hurry. Tommy hits one well to right. Sheffield backing up. Edge of the track for the catch. And before Sandy Alomar settles in, we'll tell you that for most of you after the game, it'll be your late local news. But for those of you who want more baseball, you can join Keith Oberman and Hannah Storm for our World Series postgame show, which comes on CNBC immediately after the game. Sandy is grounded into a double play and single. Bounces away from Johnson, but not far enough to allow Williams to advance. Let's look at Alomar's hitting chart. Sandy Alomar, as you see right there, normally a pole hitter, but he has the ability and will go to right field, to center. You, get, you keep pitching Alomar away, the breaking stuff, and, and fastballs away. He'll try to go that way, and he'll hit you that way with power. Big home run in that series against the Yankees for Alomar. Indians trying to get out of Florida with a split in the first two games of the World Series. They couldn't accomplish that on the road in the first two games in 95 at Atlanta. Here's a rocket to left, and this one's not coming back. The fourth home run of this postseason for Sandy Alomar makes it 6 1 Cleveland. Well, if you can tell me you can hit a breaking ball any harder than Alomar just hit that one, 
You'll never make a believer out of me. Brown with a breaking ball. Joe talked about Brown going more to breaking balls lately. Watch this one. That's a slider or a changeup down low, and Alomar really nailed it and hit it out of here and left. Uh, it was a flat whatever it was. Mm. It wasn't really a slider. It wasn't really a cut fastball. It was just spinning. Boy, that thing got out of here in a hurry. Wow. Yeah, they knew it. So Alomar makes it six to one. And now Grissom with a slow roller. It'll be a very tough play and no play for Bonilla. And you can see right there Bonilla is hobbling. And that's why he wasn't able to try to start that double play a little quicker. You see he comes in there and he really can't bend over to get down on this ball. And watch Bobby Bonilla as he chases this ball. You know right there see him dragging his leg right there. And he can't bend down like he wants to make the throw. But Marquise Grissom being a quick base runner he was not going to be able to get him anyway. But right here you can see he is just not running well at third base. And that's because he has a slight hamstring pull. Ten hits now for the Indians off Brown a very uncharacteristic outing for Kevin. O.J. helped himself his last time up with a successful sacrifice. We were talking about American League pitchers since the advent of the D.H. hitting under 100 in the World Series when they've been forced to hit. They haven't had a home run since Ken Holtzman of Oakland hit one against the Dodgers in 1974. But Holtzman had begun his career in the National League with the Cubs, so he had done a lot of hitting prior to that. Plus the D.H. rule had only been in for a couple of years at that point in the American League so Holtzman wasn't that far removed from swinging the bat. No American League pitcher has connected in the World Series since then. One and two to O.J. Joe he looks like he's using about a 32 inch bat. <laughs> He strikes out, but not before two more runs come home on the Alomar Dinger. And Brown knows it isn't his night. 6 1 Cleveland. Chad OJ had a few shaky moments early, but now he's been staked to a 6 1 lead as he works into the sixth inning and starts Bobby Bonilla with a strike. And Kevin Brown has already been scratched off Jim Leland's lineup card, so he's done. Bonilla punches one into right a late break from Manny Ramirez but he closes ground and gets there. Well a lot of people don't give Ramirez a lot of credit in right field but he's adequate out there he runs pretty well he's got he's got a very good throwing arm and of course we know about his power and his hitting outstanding hitter he got a little bit of a late break on this ball but he came on and makes a nice running catch to take a base hit away from Bonilla for the first out here in the sixth. Well the one thing Hargrove said to me is that Ramirez seems to care more about his defense now than he did before and that's why he has been improving. A ball to Conine who's one for two had an RBI single in the first. One and one. We asked Jim Leland before the game, who's your long man? He said, well, I hope I don't have to use him, but it's probably a radio. Brown threw six innings. Gave up six runs and ten hits. So maybe this doesn't qualify as long relief for Heredia, but it's a shorter outing than Leland would have hoped for from Brown. Well, you know the guy that's really done the job tonight is O.J. We talked about him at the top of the telecast. The fact that he's got control, he's got to make pitches. He's done it all night long. He's mixed in a very nice changeup, fastball away and inside to the hitters, and every once in a while a curveball. He's really kept them off balance. Allowed only five hits. Almost hit Conine. Full count. 
Well these Indians were on the brink against the Yankees and somehow came back and when they finally closed out that five game series the Yankees had the tying run at second base in the ninth. And then they played a series of simply incredible games against the Orioles. Conine lifts a high pop. Alomar off with the mask over near the railing and a lunging catch. So even though Cleveland dropped the first game here and Hershiser did not have a good night and even though they faced the ace of the Marlins staff tonight they had been in several on the brink situations before and they were undaunted. Oh you touched you touched it at the top of the telecast Bob the fact that they hadn't scored any runs for him there you see what's happened in the postseason. And and here they are. And again talking to Alomar before the game he said they were really emotionally beat after that series against Baltimore mentally tired not so much physically mentally. Now Lewis fly to deep left and double to left center and he belts this one down the left field line just as over can't get to it one hop against the wall to peg the second base Alou slides in with his second double of the night. Moises and Lewis, one of the best fastball hitters in the league, and he also swings at the first pitch quite often. He doubled on a first pitch fastball last time. He gets another fastball, this one middle in, and he turns on it and rips it down the line for a double. One thing we did find out here is that David Justice is throwing well. He threw this ball back in okay. Fastball, middle of the plate, and he does what a lot of good hitters will do with that middle of the plate fastball. He rips it down the line. And watch Justice here. We talked yesterday about his short, sore shoulder, and look at that. I mean, he just lets it go, and he makes a good throw to second base. He had said before the series, despite the tender shoulder, I'm okay, I can throw, but sometimes a player and his manager will say that just so that the other team doesn't get it in their heads to run on it and wait for a situation that comes up to prove that he can't throw before giving that away. But in this case, he showed us that he can't unleash it. Right. Johnson fouls it back. Here's the World Series schedule. A win tonight by the Indians would ensure a game five on Thursday from Jacobs Field. All the middle games start at 8 o'clock Eastern Time on NBC. If a sixth and then possibly a seventh is required, back here in Florida. O.J. steps off and Alomar will pay him a visit. Well, again, just, just to make sure they're on the same, same wavelength here, O.J. and, and maybe uh, with Alomar sticking those signs down, I think that's what O.J. is talking to him about. Putting those signs down as low as Alomar does, that runner out at second, Alou is looking right down on him. I mean, he sees him as well as O.J. Possibly going to a change here, a different set of signs. Pitch and a little roller. Williams charges, throws on the run, and gets Johnson. A lose double goes to waste for the Marlins, and they still trail it six to one. In Florida, and once again, bad architecture and its consequences. But the fact that Mike Hargrove has been wandering around the Indian dugout for the last inning or two suggests the much looser attitude down here because he usually sits in one space and just stays there for the whole game. He's walking around at his own risk now, Bob. We saw Oral Hershiser bonk his head a couple of times last night. And now Hargrove just got a low bridge. Here's Felix Heredia, the 21 year old from the Dominican Republic. The Marlins signed him when he was just 16. According to legend, his dad took a second job selling bananas as a street vendor so that young Felix would not have to go to work to supplement the meager family income so he could concentrate on playing ball. He was five and three this year in relief now of Kevin Brown. And Tony Fernandez is going to see his first action of this World Series. He'll bat for Bip Roberts for no other reason than to get him into the game.
strategically there's no indication for this move but it's right. a chance to get Tony a couple of at bats Bip cheering him on maybe let him take a couple of plays in the field before we get to Cleveland and remember Bip's thumb is probably not completely healed on his left hand so you know this is giving him a little extra time to relax and from a defensive standpoint Fernandez has played more second base this year than Bip Roberts has. Fernandez is a switch hitter, as most of you know, who hit 400 from the right side this year. He was once one of the best shortstops in the game. Won several gold gloves while playing short for the Toronto Blue Jays. Missed all of last year with a broken elbow. The Indians have Omar Vizquel, so unless he gets hurt, no one but he is going to play shortstop. Fernandez has played a lot of second base. In on his hands and a pop back into the seats. And Mike Hargrove has been nothing but complimentary about Tony Fernandez, a guy that, that has a lot of pride himself. And here is the biggest moment of his career. In a scoreless game in extra innings, he jolts one out of there off Armando Benitez. The only run in a one nothing pennant clinching victory. And he told Hargrove and, and a lot of other people he didn't want to be a part time player. But Hargrove said he's accepted his role very well wherever he's played whenever he's played. Been a big asset to this ball club. Drives one into left center field. This will split them and go to the wall. Fernandez on his way to second. And this second base tandem of Roberts and Fernandez has performed very well. But look at Vip Roberts. Jumping up and down in the Indian dugout after that double by Fernandez. Again, a fastball. This ball about knee high. Watch this. And around the outside part, Tony Fernandez right on it and drives it to the gap in left center. There it is again. He knows it's in the gap. And look at Biff Roberts. Out a boy. Two base hit for Fernandez. Add up, baby. Now the scale. Doubled, singled, walked against Brown. Fouls it off. Keith Oberman reports from the Cleveland dugout that, in fact, there is nothing wrong with Bip Roberts. Mike Hargrove just wanted to get Tony Fernandez some World Series action here. He's at second with the leadoff double. And in the bottom half of the inning, he'll be at second base with the glove on. Vizquel. With a fly ball into right center field. Over for the catch is Sheffield. Fernandez draws a throw and then scoots back to second. And Tony Fernandez, who doesn't run like he did a few years back. A couple of years back, he'd have tagged on that ball, hit to Sheffield and right, and especially with the Indians up here by five. But he thought, why? Here's the catch <laughs> by Sheffield. <laughs> And Fernandez with that tag and pulls up very quickly. The throw going by Renneria. Yeah, why? why? I'm, I'm 35 years well, old. We're winning go. by five runs. What it's kind of shallow. Long why? ride home tonight. Why? Manny Ramirez is 0 for 3. Hit a sizzling line drive to center his last time up, but right at Devon White. A strike from Heredia. Justice will be next, showing the wear and tear of a night at the ballpark. You won't be wearing those Wednesday night in Cleveland. Not because they're road, because it's going to be a little frosty there. <laughs> yeah, the draft could be troublesome. <laughs> the 0 1 pitch is skied into foul ground, wide of first, Sheffield over, but it's into the bullpen. There are two Marlins up and working the veteran Ed Bosberg and the young right hander Antonio Alfonseca. Jim Leland told us before the game he's already worked out all of his ticket problems in Cleveland. His wife has a lot of family in Pittsburgh, not that far away. He grew up in Perrysburg, Ohio. He's got him coming from both directions. Ramirez cuts and misses and down he goes. You see. Uh, 
So Fernandez began the inning with a double. He's remained at second as Vizquel has flied out and Ramirez has struck out. Here's Justice. One for two with a walk. Felix Heredia rushes it up there in a hurry. 90 plus. He's at 90, 93, 94. Here's his 1 0 pitch. And Justice bounces it down to Conine off his chest. Heredia covers. And that's the third out of the seventh. They're stretching in Florida, but they trail by five. As we move to the bottom of the seventh hour, thanks to Captain Jim Maloney and his entire crew aboard the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes for all the shots and enhance tonight's telecast. Chad OJ takes a 6 1 lead into the seventh, looking to even this 1997 World Series. Craig Council has twice popped to second base. The veteran Jim Eisenreich is in the on deck circle. And he'll bat for Heredia next. There's the 38 year old former twin, Royal, and Philly. 2 0. Oh. Sandy Alomar telling Chad OJ, slow yourself down, take it easy. There's activity in the Indians' bullpen. Hargrove would love to get one more out of OJ here with the Indians up by a score of 6 to 1. To get to him, Mike Jackson. Who's been pretty close to overpowering throughout this postseason? Council takes a strike. Mark Wiley, the pitching coach, with all the charts, seated next to Mike Hargrove. I don't think there's any doubt that Mike Jackson is the best setup man in baseball at this point. Council lifts one to right. Ramirez is right there. Another reminder after the game most of you will get your late local news but those of you who want to stick around for more baseball just have to flick over to CNBC as Keith Oberman and Hannah Storm will anchor an extended post game report. Now Eisenreich with 280 this year and had 10 pinch hits takes ball one. The last four years he was with the Phillies, hit 300 all four of those seasons, topped by 361 last year. Went to the World Series with them in 1993. He has always been a great fourth outfielder. He can fill in in the outfield, play several days in a row for you, and he's also a have, he's also been a very good pinch hitter. Taps it in front of the plate. OJ throws him out. I tell you, OJ's got his got his stuff together now. Low outside sinker that time on eyes and right. He hit that little bouncer right back to OJ. It is one more time. Down and away, a little sinker. You can see OJ turn that thing over. A little sinker down and away from Eisenreich, that little tapper right back to the mound. For the second out in the inning. Bringing up Devon White with two out and nobody aboard. And he slices one foul. The last two seasons prior to this one, the Indians led the American League in complete games. But this year they had only four. And only the Oakland A's had fewer complete games in the American League. OJ threw one of those complete games for Mike Hargrove this year. Remember that game against the Braves and Greg Maddox when Devon White stuck his knee in there he just tried to do it again against OJ. Those little inside fastballs he sticks that knee right in there. Two balls and a strike. with the pitch count. OJ has worked six and two thirds innings. He's allowed six hits. He leads six to one. Now he's thrown a couple of fastballs. 
on White. Let's see if he goes back to the changeup. Now he struck him out back in the opening inning. Changeup down and got him then. Let's see if he goes back to it here at 2-2. See what Alomar sticks down. Fastball away. Fastball in. Changeup. Breaking ball. Off speed. All of those. Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Multiple options. And, and then <laughs> you tell him to hit her that at the same time. A veritable pitching yeah. buffet. Mm -hmm. Take a look at Sandy Alomar when he sticks those sides down almost on the ground. You can't see him from the side from either dugout. Change up. And it's a fair ball down into the right field corner. A two out hit for White. And he cruises in with a double. I think that's bad communication there between the first baseman and the catcher. A lot of times when you're going to throw a changeup, you tell the corner guy, meaning the first baseman with a left-handed hitter up, that a changeup is coming. Watch, he's completely fooled by this pitch. But because it's a changeup, he's able to pull it around the bag. A lot of times you tell the first baseman that a changeup's coming, and they lean a little bit toward the line. Hargrove has already sent the call out from Mike Jackson. We'll send you these commercial messages and then come back to Pro Player Stadium. Earlier this year, Chad O.J. was on the disabled list with strained ligaments in his right elbow, his pitching elbow, and it's wrapped just as a precaution to keep it warm here as Mike Jackson comes out of the bullpen. He was 2-5 and five during the regular season. Another look at O.J. But here's the relevant number on Mike Jackson. Eight and two-thirds innings of pitching in the postseason. No runs, 12 strikeouts. Renteria takes him the other way. Ramirez has it lined up. And Manny makes it look a little bit more difficult than perhaps it actually was. But all that counts is that the inning is over. And the Indians are six outs away from evening this thing. Back at Pro Player Stadium. Another crowd in excess of 60,000 on hand as they've opened up the football seats here. And this is our first look of this postseason at Antonio Alfonseca. 25 year old from the Dominican Republic, one and three this year, with an ERA of nearly five. Matt Williams is the first man to face him in the eighth. And the fastball is fouled back. There is a distinct Latin American flavor to this Marlin roster, Alfonseca and Heredia, who preceded him on the mound in this game, and Moises Alou, all from the Dominican Republic, Levon Hernandez, of course, from Cuba, Edgar Renteria from Colombia. Players like Alex Fernandez and Alex Arias are American-born, but with Hispanic ancestry. Hit toward the hole and a base hit for Matt Williams. And all those Latin American players on the roster Goes over very well here. Of course, the large Hispanic population in South Florida. There's Hernandez. Well, Bobby Bonilla, we've talked about how bad his left hamstring is, is right now. Look at him right there. You can see that he's grimacing as he's running after the ball and no chance to make the play. But you wonder sometimes. Last night, Gary Sheffield was ill. He remained in the ball game, but Bonilla will bat in the eighth inning. Tommy goes the other way. Moises Salou comes racing in and gets there. Sandy Alomar coming up, and Keith Oberman has some information on him. Keith? Bob, that uh, two run homer in the sixth inning by Sandy Alomar Jr. was more than just a key hit for the Indians in their six to one lead here in the eighth inning. This, Sandy Alomar says, is his present to his father, Sandy Alomar Sr., who turns 54 today. He said he forgot to get him something more tangible, but he still loves him, and I think the home run will be a good enough gift. Bob? <laughs> and much less expensive. <laughs> If I'd have known it was his birthday, I would have sent him a glove. <laughs> when Sandy played and I, we were playing, we were playing against each other, I'd always send him gloves, and he would break them in because I couldn't break them in like he did. And I'd send him a couple, he'd break a couple in, send one back to me. What do you get a little shortstop, second baseman? Yeah. And Sandy hits one in the air to center field. Devon White scarcely has to move, and that's the second out. Well, Sandy Alomar Sr., can now watch the World Series without the feeling of ambivalence that must have gripped him during the American League Championship Series with son Roberto playing for the Orioles and Sandy of course catching for the Indians in fact 
the final yeah. pitch brought yeah. jubilation <laughs> and dejection right. all at the same time. Roberto Alomar called out on strikes to end Baltimore's season and Sandy Alomar Jr. leaping in the air with the joy of heading for the World Series again. But if I know Sandy like I think I know Sandy he was pulling for Sandy Alomar Sr. to win because Junior has a couple of world championships and and uh, I mean Roberto has a couple of championships and Sandy Alomar Jr. doesn't have any. Grissom pokes one into right. There's his third hit of the night. And another low fastball. Grissom tonight. Previous couple of base hits, pitches were down and tough pitches to hit. This is not a bad pitch. Low outside fastball. Watch him go down and get this thing and line it to right field. Watch this. Right there. And right on it. And the line drive base hit to right. There's that last pitch, 92 miles an hour, coming down a couple of inches off the outside corner. He went down and got it and lines it to right. And they're going to have to rethink their scouting report on Grissom and try to pitch him in a different spot. Because all the low pitches he's had, he's hit hard. And even in last night's ball game, he got a low fastball and hit it down the right field line for a base hit. Joe, to finish up the story on Alomar, Sandy told me he's going to be in Cleveland. We may get a chance to see him this week. Oh, great. Yeah, he's going to be there. Mike Jackson bats for himself. This is his first at bat of this season, but he's been with several clubs, including Philadelphia, San Francisco, and then Cincinnati briefly in the National League. So he has hit before in the majors, and he will hack. Moments ago, here was the exchange between Dave Nelson and Marquise Grissom down at first. All right. Jack been talking all that talk about how good he can hit. Let's see what he's gonna do. <laughs> Is it funny how your nicknames always follow you around you? That's what they call him in San Francisco, Jack. Jack. Yeah. <laughs> it's better than K's. <laughs> hey, what if you got a hit from here the last one? Two on, two out. And Al Fonseca's one two pitch to Mike Jackson. And he slices one to right, but foul. So at least he made some contact. Well, let's take a look at this swing. He is a hacker. I mean, he will <laughs> hack. He stepped way in the bucket. Yeah, he's bailing big and time. He leaves the bat behind, but. That reminds me of a story. I was talking to Willie Mays once. I asked him, what size bat do you use? I use 36 ounces. I said, why so big? He said, Joe, you know, I leave there a little bit sometimes. I have to leave something behind if I'm going to do any damage. Jackson left something behind there. Wasn't the bat. Council from the outfield grass. But Jackson can walk with pride back toward the dugout. He put the ball in play. And it's still 6-1 Cleveland. Well, if the Marlins plan to do something, this would probably be the inning. Sheffield, Bonilla, and Conine are due. Still Sheffield in this series. Really nothing to hit. Bounced into a double play back in the fifth inning. Prior to that, hit by a pitch and walked. And a strike, says Dale Ford. Speaking of the umpires, one of their own, Doug Harvey, one of the great umpires of our generation. He's back home in San Diego. He's been retired for several years. Suffering from throat cancer and several of the umpires made it a point to let us know that they wanted their best wishes sent along to Doug Harvey. Great National League umpire and a real presence. Great he carried guy. himself in a regal fashion. I mean he took command of the ball game. Called Thank everyone's you. son. And some he some players and managers him. called him God mm -hmm. because of the way he ruled over a ball game. He's an outstanding guy. He really is. So our best to Doug Harvey. Two and one to Sheffield. A line drive base hit. Bonilla's coming up. Jim Gray, Jim. All 
right, Bob, but as Bobby Bonilla was in the on-deck circle, he told me that his left hamstring really is bothering him quite a bit tonight. He said, I've had much, much better days. I'm fairly immobile, he said. I don't want to come out of the game because I fear it'll tighten up even more and that could put me in jeopardy Tuesday. I asked him about Tuesday. He said he doesn't feel it'll be a problem. However, as we said at the top of the show, the cold weather is a major concern to both him, Jim Leland, and the training staff. It is not a good situation, and he is having a lot of trouble moving around. Bob? Well, the one advantage he can have Tuesday is that he can be a DH, and they can keep some heat on that hamstring during the mm -hmm. ball game and in between innings keep it warm. We saw him touch that left hamstring again. That first pitch from Jackson, a bad pitch, and Bonilla just had a half-hearted cut at it. Joe, you know, it, it might be a problem too for him driving off that leg as he strides here, as he pushes. The one-one pitch is outside by World Series standards. As we move now past mid-October, this is not at all a chilly night. No. But for South Florida, it's worth noting, we're now into the 60s. 69 degrees right now. Very pleasant 69. Two and two. Bonilla has flied out to all three outfield positions. To center in the first. To left in the third. To right in the sixth. Well, the one thing, if from the left side, you know, you can you put a lot of pressure on your front leg, and that's probably the problem that he's having. He puts a lot of pressure there. And he strikes out swinging. Actually tipped the ball back into Alomar's glove, and Sandy held it. Here again, that last sequence to Bonilla. Chased the low one off the outside corner. Couple fastballs. Misses a fastball there, and then the slider down low. Went after it and missed that one. So Bonilla is now 0 for 4. And you saw Jeff Conine walk past him in the dugout, which was your first clue that Conine is done because this should be his turn at bat. And with the right hander out there in this late inning situation, Darren Dalton comes off the bench to pinch hit. When you watch Mike Jackson, I mean, he has a variety of speeds on this slider. He throws a lot of sliders, has a 90 plus mile an hour fastball to keep the hitters honest, but basically his out pitch is a tough slider that he throws at two or three different speeds. And he has great location with that slider. We're in the bottom of the eighth. Cleveland leads it six to one. Dalton pulls it foul. He's a guy that I'm sure that looking back Seattle wish they would have signed over the winter instead of letting him get away and go to Cleveland. Cleveland's thankful for having him because when Jose Mesa was not available he was their closer and he did a great job since Mesa has been back he's been a setup man. Well Seattle struggled with its bullpen all year. Down and in two and one. Speaking of Mesa he's off in the bullpen. Paul Asenmacher, the left-hander. There he is, the veteran. Dalton with a drive to left, and a long drive it is. Back near the fence is Justice, and in front of the 361 sign, he takes it. Well, let's look ahead to Tuesday night's Game 3. You'll see it on NBC at 8 o'clock Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Have to break out the overcoats in all likelihood for game three at Jacobs Field. Games four and five if a fifth game is necessary and that appears more and more likely with the Indians leading here late in the game. All eight o'clock Eastern time starts Tuesday Wednesday Thursday in Cleveland. Now Lewis fly to deep left and double twice. This is the way the pitching is set up. Left hander lighter against Nagy. Rookie Jarrett Wright against Tony Saunders. And Hirschheiser and Hernandez come back in game five. Roll to third, Matt Williams. Goes the short way. Hernandez covering. And that closes the Marlins out of the eighth. Still 6 1 Cleveland. As we go to the ninth. 
Darren Dalton who pinch hit for Jeff Conine remains in the game at first base. Tony Fernandez steps back in. This has worked out pretty well for Mike Hargrove. You got Fernandez two turns at bat one from each side as it happens. He doubled right handed in the seventh now left handed. The count to him is a ball and a strike. He's also gotten to handle the ball a couple of times in the field. So if he wanted to work Tony in the last three innings of this game it's worked. Well not only that you have to remember the Marlins are probably going to throw two left handers in Cleveland which means that Bip Roberts will probably go to left field and a second base hit as he slashes this one past Bobby Bonilla Bobby might have made the play but I'm pretty sure they'll score it a hit. Well Bobby probably shouldn't be out there trying to make a play. Right. He's got a bad hamstring. I'm surprised he hasn't come out of the ball game but this ball is ripped and uh, he tried to come up with it but he doesn't. But Bobby Bonilla clearly has shown us tonight that his hamstring is bothering him and you just wonder why he wouldn't come out of the ball game get some ice on it and start working toward Tuesday. He's about a day late and a dollar short on that because yeah, this could be a long series and you Smash need Bobby Bonilla. Yep. Now Vizquel to face Alfonseca. It is a base hit for Tony Fernandez the 14th Cleveland hit tonight. Left side, Bonilla over. Has a play. Well, we've had Dave Nelson mic'd all night, and between innings, he was talking to an opponent about the weather in Cleveland. Listen. Yeah, boy. You know, uh, a few days ago it was in the 50s, but now they're talking about uh, flurries and everything. Oh man. <laughs> I, I second that. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to Darren Dalton over there. Yeah. And there are those guys, those of us that are, oh, man. <laughs> 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 you California guys, come on. A Milwaukee guy like you, you, reveling in that chilly weather. Ramirez down to Bonilla, who goes to his knees to make the play, and they turn the double play. Three to end the top of the night, but the Marlins come up needing five to keep this one going. It's not a save situation, but Mike Hargrove wants to get Jose Mesa his closer an inning of work here. An off day tomorrow. And Tuesday night, game three in Cleveland. And now Greg Zahn, the backup catcher, will get an at bat. He'll hit for Charles Johnson to start the bottom of the ninth. So CJ is out. He was 0 for 3 tonight. This is Zahn's first at bat of the postseason. He hit 301 for the year. He's a switch hitter. Ace's fastball is bounced to Fernandez. And there's the first out. As we look at Fernandez, you have to remember, although Roberts, like Fernandez, is also a switch hitter. Tony hit 400 from the right side. And Leiter and Saunders are the first two pitchers for the Marlins, both left handers, when we get to Cleveland. So it's very likely that Fernandez will be the starter in those games. And tonight's Chevrolet player of the game is not Al Leiter, who will pitch in Cleveland, but rather Chad OJ, who stands to be the winner. Six and two thirds effective innings. Johnny Gorl up there with a handshake for OJ. He really did. He pitched a beautiful ball game tonight. Council's over three. Two and oh. Location, location. Did good pitches tonight. Used the off speed stuff very effectively. And did it from the opening inning on. Strike on the inside corner. Cliff Floyd has moved into the on deck circle for what will be his first postseason at bat. There's the one time minor league sensation, used to be the property of the Expos. Council grounds it just foul.
tell you what, when you can pull Mesa's fastball, I mean, you're getting the head out there pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Inside fastball yeah. that time, Joe. When you look at Mesa from the Dominican Republic on the mound, and we mentioned all the Latin American players on the Marlin roster, and the percentage of players of Hispanic background in the major leagues keeps growing. In the vicinity of 20% right now as Council hits the dirt. You realize what an influence, a growing influence they are on the quality of Major League Baseball. That last fastball by Mason, if that one hits you, your ankles start growing, I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> that ran the count out full, and here's the 3 2 pitch. Council with a one out walk. So now here comes the pinch hitter Cliff Floyd who was just added to the roster for the World Series. He had been off the roster in favor of utility man John Wayner in the division series and the LCS added for the World Series. Once one of the most promising prospects in baseball plagued by injuries the last few years. Described when he first hit the major leagues as Willie McCovey with legs. <laughs> That's pretty big. <laughs> That's pretty big <laughs> reputation to live up to, though. Willie Whoa. McCovey over 500 home runs, most mm -hmm. valuable player in the leagues. But when McCovey first came up, he could run, Bobby. Just reporting what was on the <laughs> scouting report. And Floyd is 6'4 and 235, so a big guy. Like McCovey, there's John Wayner in uniform, but not on the active roster for this World Series. Floyd hit 234 this year with six home runs on the disabled list twice. A ball and a strike. A lot of people think he will be there. Everyday first baseman for this ball club next year. Both Conine and Dalton are veterans. Both make hefty salaries. Marlins might be looking to trim payroll even if they win it all. One and two. So to finish up about the burgeoning number of Latin American players in the major leagues international scouting becomes more and more important in the Caribbean in South America or even a handful of Japanese and Australian players either in the major leagues or on their way. We mentioned last night that some 20 Cuban ball players have defected in the last few years and some of them are already in the major leagues. Floyd walks away a strikeout victim as a pinch hitter for the second out in the Marlin ninth. There's that last breaking ball from Jose Mesa down low and inside and Floyd goes after it. A spin on that breaking ball curveball down low and inside or slider and down low and inside he goes after the strikeout 80 mile per hour. Look at that an eight inch break mm -hmm. that ball dropped almost straight down. Mm -hmm. Now Devon White, two for four, has a single and double tonight. Tommy backhands it, shovels it over to Mesa covering, and that closes it out. So after losing 7-4 last night, the Indians bounce back and hang a loss on the Marlin ace Kevin Brown behind Chad O.J. with the help of a Sandy Alomar Jr. home run. They win it 6-1, and it's even at a game apiece as we head for Cleveland on Tuesday night. We'll be right back of a home run that serves as we mentioned earlier in the broadcast as a very cheap and effective birthday present for a uh, father of yours well uh, <laughs> my dad's birthday uh, is today and uh, I didn't buy anything even though I gave him a watch last week I, uh, I redeemed myself and I gave him uh, a home run so uh, should be happy and another thing uh, I have a friend of mine here that his little kid Spencer Castro gave me a powerful gum and I chew that gum the whole night there you go. It's gum and birthday presents. Bob, back up to you. 
It's not just any gum. You heard him say it. It was powerful gum. <laughs> One can only guess as to the ingredients. So apparently, just to clear it up, Sandy is not a stingy son. He gave his dad a watch last week, a week before his birthday, and now they can gift wrap the game two victory and the two run Alomar home run. So once again, the final score, the Indians win it six to one. Here's another contribution by Sandy, the peg to third to cut down Moises Salou. Tuesday on NBC, game three of the World Series, eight o'clock Eastern, five o'clock Pacific, as we head north to Cleveland and Jacobs Field. Now for viewers in the Eastern and Central time zones, stay tuned for Jenny, followed by your late local news. For those of you who want to continue with post-game activities, Keith and Hannah on CNBC, immediately after the conclusion of this telecast, which is right now, because for Joe Morgan, Bob Euchre, Jim Gray, Hannah Storm, and Keith Oberman, I'm Bob Costas. So long from South Florida.